Chairman Leone, Chairman Boucher, Chairman Guerrera, Representative Carney, members of the Transportation Committee. It takes all day just to say all that, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, I was going to make think, it short and say what I a think nice. Whoever wants to come up, just say good morning, and that's it. Well, so we're going to be here till midnight. I was going to say what a nice Italian quartet, but the guy from Saybrook <laughs> messed it all up. And happy birthday to you. You don't look a day over 25. I am here today, uh, good morning, I'm here today to testify on two bills, HB 5178, an act concerning three-point seat belts on school buses, and uh, HB 5773, an act requiring legislative approval for bus and rail fare increases. Regarding the, uh, the former, um, we're back again with this, and I want to thank you for, uh, for giving this a public hearing. I know Representative uh, Guerrero was instrumental several years ago uh, in getting something passed uh, after a tragedy in his school district. And uh, if I remember correctly, how we uh, addressed it was we increased the uh, money to uh, a fee for someone who had lost their license from 125 to about $175, and it went into a fund. Um, unfortunately, no towns accessed it, and the state uh, started to raid it to pay, you know, to go into the general fund, unfortunately. But since then, we've had several bus accidents in, in my hometown, including a, a, a class that came up to, to the Capitol for a tour. And on the way back to, uh, to Costco, they got in an accident in uh, Middle, Middletown. And then, of course, in the last few months, there have been several tragic accidents across the country where there have been multiple fatalities. So what I'm asking is if we can consider somehow, you know, thinking outside the box like we did, I think, back in 2011, and somehow get this money back into that fund there and, and, and really promote it to the towns. Um, did I say something? <laughs> um, <laughs> Was that a sign of your bill going down or something? I, I just see. I, I I, it wouldn't be the first but time. But it, it came right back up, Representative, so you're good. I wasn't down for the count. Anyway, so I would hopefully we can we can really uh, seriously look into doing that again and, and maybe promoting it to the towns, all 169 municipalities, and making them aware that it's there. And as far as the second bill, uh, requiring legislative approval for bus and rail fare, uh, fare increases, I want to thank Representative Laviel for taking the lead on that. Last year, last fall, we, several of us, got a couple thousand signatures uh, from our constituents. Now, I represent a town where there's an awful lot of commuters, and they, they've been shouldering the burden on this. They've really been paying a lot. In 2012, they had a 5 percent increase. In 2013, they had a 5 percent increase. In 2014, they had a 5 percent increase. 2015, 1 percent, and 6 percent last year. Enough is enough. I mean, they, they really, they're, they are on that train every day. It's bad enough do, doing that commute. But to be, you know, funding budget shortfalls on their backs, I think, is unfair. So I would hope that maybe we can get a say as their voice up here in approving these, these increases. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. And um, thank you very much for bringing both of these um, uh, legislative issues to, our, to us here. Um, as you know, th that was near and dear to my heart and still is. Um, over the past few years, we've seen more and more bus accidents. And it does worry me that, you know, that, you know, we tell everyone to, buckle up in their vehicles, but then we send off our children into these buses, which they say is very safe, don't get me wrong, but still, you know, you, they flip over, whatever, these children go, you know, from one part of a bus to another part of the bus, and I just always never could imagine why, um, in today's technology, why we can't implement something like that. And as you know, we did put some uh, money back then, it was Senator Franz and myself, uh, came up with some language to, to take some of those fundings from those license fees and put it into a pool, but unfortunately none of the districts took advantage of it. Um, I think it's something that we need to look at very hard. Um, I don't know what's out there. I think it's, it'd be uh, beneficial to all of us to maybe to have them in front of us. The industry itself, who makes these buses, is it possible to do it? But as you know, there's been many arguments going back and forth in regards to if it was an emergency, how do you get them out of those seatbelts? You know, how do you buckle them in those seatbelts? And um, you know, it's not, it's not easy. But again, it, it is a scary thought 
that when one of these buses do get in an accident that, you know, I don't even want to think about it, to be quite honest with you. But, but thank you for bringing it to our attention. Um, Senator Eloni, followed by uh, Senator Boucher. Thanks, Representative, for bringing up this very important issue. Good to see you, by the way. Good to see you, too. Um, I know this has always been a concern for, for a lot of the districts and, you know, protecting our children, of which I think everyone wants to support. And I'm supportive of the efforts. My only question becomes down to the cost, right? Um, and the fact that we did set aside a fund that they could have, uh, the districts could have gone after some funding, not to say it would have been enough for everything. Uh, the fact that they didn't sends a message albeit not a good one, that they didn't take advantage of a fund that was there. So I guess as we try to work this issue forward, because I think anything we can do to protect the kids is, is, is worth doing, uh, but it always comes down to cost, and, and as my co-chair just mentioned, some of the, the practicality of how do you get a kid buckled in, unbuckled if an emergency occurs, and still get them to school on time and, and all that. Um, that the, uh, we really need to get the district's input um, and, the, and the municipalities as well. Um, some of these buses are private entities, not always municipal or state funded. Um, so it, it comes down to where does the money come from once the costs are truly identified. So as we, I, I think it's a great thing that we work on this. I think we still have a long way to go. Um, I'm happy to work with you <coughs> to figure some of those details out. But uh, the more that we can get the folks that have to implement and be directly affected chiming in support of this that would go a long way towards passage I believe thanks thank you yes and, and I honestly think a lot of towns didn't even know it was available because I know I spoke with representatives in my town that they didn't so it was I think on us for not uh, not letting them be aware of it uh, Senator Boucher Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and it's great to see you, Representative Camilla. Hi, Senator. Uh, and thank you for uh, weighing in on both of these two very important points. I have to say that uh, school seatbelts have been a, a part of my uh, uh, government experience for quite a long time, even <coughs> locally on the school board and now here a number of years as well. And um, it, it just seems to be such common sense that we would have seatbelts on uh, school buses, and yet there are many that have testified as to the problems surrounding them additionally and a lot of times seat belts that are on there don't fit well for that small child that they you know they either can slide underneath them they can be in fact a hazard uh, to safety at times so um, doing better with this and I actually have a constituent uh, in my district that is actually developing uh, not just a three-point but a five-point seat belt that would really be very safe and the question then becomes how do you convince uh, school districts and busing companies about the cost effectiveness, the need with such competing, competing other financial concerns. So the, I think this is absolutely an important issue for us to really research and discuss and find a way, given the kind of financial condition the state finds itself in and putting more pressure financially on our local towns and schools. Um, it's such a difficult time. It's another one of those issues that becomes uh, a sort of the collateral damage of the financial problems of the state and local municipalities. So uh, it's great that you have brought this forward. I'm really supportive of it. And I'm really pleased that you're one of the folks that uh, is able to be a strong voice for our commuters. Uh, as you know, and the impetus for a lot of these bills, and not just the one that we're um, hearing today, but there are others that are exactly the same that are being brought out too uh, in our session here in the Transportation Committee. The, the fact that um, we have public hearings to hear from the commuter on how they feel about a, a rail uh, cost hike, and so many come out uh, to discuss why this is not a good thing for them. Uh, the preponderance, 100% nearly, all against those raises and then unilaterally you find a raise just <coughs> gets enacted immediately and they feel that they've lost a voice and they're very concerned about that given the, the state of, of rail transit, the amount of use of it and how many increases they've already suffered. Mm -hmm. So I think the idea of making it harder to just unilaterally ignore the public's outcry and have the legislature weigh in on this uh, <coughs> is a very good idea and I'm glad that you uh, saw fit to come and, and be an advocate for them. 
Well, thank you. Yes, and that's, to be honest, I mean, no, <laughs> no citizen likes to have their taxes or fees increased. Uh, they're never going to be in favor of that. But this particular group has been hit, as I said, particularly hard since 2012, every single year. And uh, I think we're our, their only, their only, uh, you know, defense really against that. And we we need to uh, at least give ourselves the tools to to be their voice at the time when they need it the most. Thank you, Senator Boucher. Uh, Representative Carney, followed by Representative Morin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Representative Camillo, for coming here today to testify on these, on these two bills. Do you know of any other states uh, that have implemented the school bus seatbelt law and, and, how, uh, and how it's gone for those states that have done so? You know, that's a good question. Uh, I had asked NCSL that question uh, a couple of years ago, and I think there were a couple, but I didn't do it this year. Um, I did speak with my own district, and I know these. Each municipality has a contract with a, a school company that does this school bus company. So some are different. I mean, in, in Greenwich, I think they get they don't use the seat, the school buses after seven years. Uh, they're very, very uh, you know concerned about safety, and and those buses go somewhere else. So this would have to be factored in. You know between the municipalities and, and when they're doing, sending out their RFPs. But, uh, you know, I believe there are a couple of states that have done this, but I'll double check and get back to you on that. Okay, that'd be great. Um, on, that, on that bill, the only thing that, that does concern me is, is the drivers themselves. Uh, you know, I, I'm already hearing that it's already difficult enough to find school bus drivers. And my only concern is, is you know, when, when little kids sometimes will play around with the seatbelt and, and you never know, I mean, how is that driver going to be able to know every single kid on that bus has their seatbelt on? And if they don't have the seatbelt on, you know, do they pull the, the, the bus over and get out and help the kid? Or would there have to be another teacher or, or somebody else on that bus, a parent? Uh, and, and that's the only, that's my only concern is how do we overcome that particular issue? Uh, I mean, a lot of times these school, uh, school bus drivers are parents themselves and they're just doing it, you know, as a small part-time job. But I mean, that's, I'm sure that's something we can, we can look further into. Uh, uh, on the other piece of legislation, I'm just curious coming from, I know uh, they, the DOT thankfully did come to Old Saybrook to have a, uh, a public hearing on the, the fare increases. You know, folks from my area oftentimes will take two trains. They'll take the Shoreline East and they'll take uh, uh, Metro North if they're going to New York or Stanford. Uh, but I'm just curious about, and if you don't, that's fine. How much does it cost commuters from Greenwich and I'm, t I'm talking about if you have if the park uh, a train ticket I don't know if you know maybe on average or what the daily rate is or anything like that yeah I know in Greenwich the, to get a, a monthly pass just to park your car it's about four hundred and sixty four dollars um, so it's not cheap to go you know, off peak to from Greenwich to Grand Central I think it's about nineteen dollars that's off peak um, obviously when they're going there's it's it's not off peak so it, it's a pretty hefty bill there too, and you know to, their options are limited. You know there, there's not many boats going in there, and, and if you drive, you're stuck in a tra traffic jam around the George Washington Bridge and the, going to the west side or the east side on the RFK Bridge. So it, they, this is really, and we really don't want the cars on the road. This is the whole point of mass transit. There's, it's, it's you know hopefully to get people to use out of their cars, but. Um, they're kind of held captive here. And if we don't stand up for them each time there's a budget shortfall and put it on their backs, then what are we doing? Right, right. And I agree. And I, and I thank you for that. Because uh, to me, I don't, what I, what I worry about is if it ends up being cheaper to drive or ends up making more sense to drive. Because the whole goal, I think, as a, as a country or as a state and certainly as a country is to get cars off the road to, to ease up traffic to you know ease up pollution and things like that so I mean I'm a big fan of, of commuter travel uh, rail travel so I, I do think this is a good idea and, and it's something I'd like to see happen because uh, I, I did attend the public hearing and it sort of to me just felt like you know we told them how we felt and it went one in ear and went out the other so so I thank you for that and I, and I look forward to supporting this bill thanks thank you representative thank you representative uh, representative Warren Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good to see you. Representative Camillo, how's things in Costco? Uh, we're hanging in there, Representative. It's a fine we, place. We miss you. <laughs> yeah, me as well. So it's, it's not me, Mr. Chairman. I think it was Senator Larson. He left his phone here. Um, so I, I appreciate your testimony. 
It's always good to blame the guy that's not here, right? It's, um, I, I appreciate especially your testimony on, on the seat belts. I've, I've supported you and, and, and a good chairman on that. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult issue. Um, I've read a lot of the testimony that's come in, and, and so, you, you know, oftentimes people will say to us it's cost. It's a horrible cost to our districts. And we all know we represent diverse districts. Everybody's district can afford or not afford things easier. But let's, uh, the, the one thing that I get to, and, and have, I don't know if you've heard this, is the concern, I think uh, Representative Carney brought it up, is what do you do um, when there is something wrong, something happens, and how do you get these kids out of them, especially little ones? We talk about, listen, if a high school kid or middle school kid, they're, they're, unless they're injured, they're going to be able to figure it out. But little, little kids, is that a concern that you've heard from people in your district? You know, not, that's a great question, Representative. Not so much in my district, but I've heard it over the years when we're debating this. You know, that comes up, and what ha and the unruly kid, what do you do with them? And, you know, last time I was asked, I brought up um, Giuseppe Santaguida, who was our bu bus driver back in the, well, a while ago, say. And uh, when we were acting up, he stopped the bus, and we didn't do it again. Today, you, you couldn't do that. You'd go to jail. So, um you know, if, I think just a warning to the kids, to the parents, and if it happens again, like everything else, there's suspension, they'll be walking or, or getting a ride. Um, but as far as, it, you know, to your first question there, um, you know, the National Highway Safety Transportation Board has reversed after all these years of saying, for, for one of those reasons, for the reasons you just cited, that, you know, these are not safe, it's better off without them on the buses. They have re they reversed in 2015, saying now that these actually will save lives. So, you know, they put a lot of thought and money and study into it. So I would have to, you know, defer to them on that one. Thank you, Representative. I, I, listen, I'm, I, I agree with, with what you and the, and the chair are saying. Um, you know, today's world of technology, we should be able to figure this out and uh, keep our kids safe. The other thing, uh, I, just, I just need to touch base on, on the, your comments uh, concerning the Metro North increases and, and having uh, some history with your predecessor for many years who oftentimes his business was right on the line and, and I, I certainly have always been a strong supporter of mass transit. I've been a strong supporter of Metro North. Um, because you're right, we do need to keep cars off the road, and it, it's a better way. I mean, there's there's a downside. We talk about what it would cost to park in Greenwich. You brought that up, but I, I'd be interested to see what it costs if they decided to drive. What it would cost them to park in their jobs in the city. I imagine it might be a little more than 460 a month. Um, and and you made a comment about fixing the budget shortfall, and and I just want to touch base with you, Representative. Um, Last I knew, and I'm not 100% sure, so I'm hoping that someone on this committee can get us, but do you know what it costs for each rider, the subsidy that the state of Connecticut puts in for each rider that utilizes Metro North? I did know that when I was on this committee with Representative Guerrero and Rep Representative Scribner. We had those figures, and uh, with time, uh, it's, my, it's gone a little bit cloudy well, in my mind. And, and I'm not 100% sure, but back in the day at DOT, I, it used to be around $26 per person. And, you know, we, we, fight, we, we fight about the busway and people are unhappy with mass transit and they don't want to subsidize that and it's a waste of money. But on the flip side, there is a real cost to the state. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying I'm against it because obviously you know I support what Metro North provides and the services, but there's a cost to it that does weigh heavily on the state of Connecticut every time somebody rides that that service. Yeah. And I think as, as our society, we're willing to, to pay that. I am. But, I mean, when you're looking at a subsidy of, if it's 20 bucks or 30 bucks, that's still, I mean, where does the user's responsibility go in on that as well to share that cost? I'm not sure that I agree that we're just funding a budget shortfall with affecting wages, uh, not wages, but um, fees to utilize public services. Uh, I, but I think you, you always make um, fair points, and I, and I will listen to, to what you and your colleagues have to say, but I, I did want to mention that. Thank you, Representative. Well, thank you, Representative Morin, and I know Senator Morano is, is, is very proud of you. Um, the, the issue here, we need to somehow raise the revenue without going back to the same old people. And I, I know um, Representative Steinberg and I have been trying to get a, a, a meeting with the commissioner of DOT about this. When we testified at a public hearing in Stanford, he said he'd be willing to meet with us. He was open-minded to corporate, corporate sponsorship of rail cars, which is, uh, 
which is done in other venues, done other locales they do it. You know, you have a captive audience in the rail car there. And, you know, we do this, as we say, every two years, every year. We do this in baseball stadiums. And I'm not a big fan of baseball stadiums being named, you know, having corporate names. But a rail car, who has a sentimental attachment to the rail car? Fair Not enough, me. Representative. I guess if we're looking for revenues, tolls would be a good way, right? <laughs> 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 I just see who's uh, paying attention over there on the leadership side. Thank you, Representative. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Took the words right out of my uh, mouth there, Representative Warren. Especially when I heard Representative Camille said, you know, same old people are paying for it. Imagine all those out-of-staters that would be paying for this. But um, Representative Laviel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Happy birthday to you. And uh, Representative Camillo, very good to see you. And I, I would like to address your testimony on House Bill 5773 with the rail fares. Uh, you mentioned the petition that we circulated last year uh, on Metro North trains uh, in the morning and all the signatures. Uh, and I know that you participated uh, very prominently in that. Um, do you recall whether the commuters who uh, have ended up with a large increase, whether they got any service improvements related to that increase or whether there were any raises in operating costs that were associated with those increases? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question, Representative. Uh, no, I have not heard that at all. I know that the complaints have come down s s from a few years ago when they're at an all-time high, but no, nothing, uh, in fact, the opposite, that they've, they're paying for something that, um, you know, the, it, this did not go towards the new MA cars. This was certainly, this is for a budget shortfall. Right, so it was essentially the same service for a higher price. Yes. Thank you. And um, in the same exercise as collecting the signatures for the petition, uh, you were one of the signatories, one of the 18, I believe, signatories on a letter sent to uh, Commissioner Redeker and um, leadership in the House proposing some revenue alternatives that would not have come out of the DOT budget. Am yes. I right? Yes. That is correct. Um, yes, and I will never forget that day getting uh, spending several hours at Representative Pacino and then ended up getting my uh, getting pickpocketed and losing my phone <laughs> first time ever but uh, so yeah that I'll, I'll always remember that day well uh, thank you and as I recall and you'll you'll help me with this if I'm wrong uh, while the commissioner responded explaining that the DOT had no further resources and that it was either a cut to service or a raise in fares, that we did not receive a response either from the Speaker or the Senate President. Am, am I correct? I was not aware of one, no. Okay. The, um, the, the, the problem was that they, they did not need to respond to us because they had no, they didn't have that cognizance over the DOT budget, whereas if we were going to have recourse to any of the solutions outside the DOT budget to uh, actually respond to this uh, uh, distressing development for commuters, we would have had to go outside the DOT budget to the legislature to vote on a transfer <coughs> of, of funds. Am I right? You're absolutely correct. We we did everything we could. We we asked for a public hearing and was was granted one. We p gave petition <coughs> signatures from there are many petitions and uh, we couldn't stop it. So I mean, this would give this if we were to pass this. This would give us our only only way to to stop to at least debate and discuss it. Because maybe there is a you know down the road there is going to be a time where you know it's called for. But certainly. The last five or six years, uh, you know, one after another, is it's backbreaking for them. Well, I, I appreciate your candor and your testimony, Representative. The I think that not only is it distressing when the fares keep going up and up for commuters, but the and and certainly it's a good thing for legislators to debate, discuss, and be accountable. But there's also the the simple fact 
that um, if the DOT is controlling all decisions, the only money that's available for the DOT to work with is in its own budget. And if we are to look for alternatives that exist, which we did, we had a couple of tax exemptions we were proposing to eliminate. Uh, if there are other alternatives to be called into play, the legislature needs to look at appropriations and at existing taxes in order to do it. So I think there is a, a real concrete reason to uh, reorganize who has the authority to actually vote on these fair increases. Thank you very much for your testimony, Representative. Thank you, and I would agree. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, thank you very much, Representative Camille. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Thank you very much.